Hey, welcome to Mech 1348. We're going to go through chapter one out of our book. All right, uh, we are going to spend a lot of the class actually programming the PLCs. Uh, we're going to do some Alan Bradley, we're going to do some Siemens. Uh, if there's time, we're going to be doing our Mitsubishi uh, PLCs as well. So, uh, we are going to get through the lectures and the, the, the chapters, you know, fairly quickly uh, because I want the heart and soul of this class for you guys to literally be programming PLCs understanding ladder logic and that sort of thing uh, but chapter one is going to just go through the basics uh, as we go over uh, you know what plc's are and you know what they entail all right so the basic right programmable logic controllers that's what plc stands for you know as we go through this they are very widely used in industry now the plc it didn't fully replace relay logic but for the most part, if we have large systems, we're going to have PLCs uh, running the system. So a PLC is basically just a computer, okay? But it's specified to do only certain specific tasks. So it doesn't have like an operating system like Windows or, um, you know, whatever Mac uses OS or Safari. It doesn't have search engines, you know, like you know, Internet Explorer or Chrome or those sort of things on it. You put a specific program on a PLC, and that's the task that it does and goes through. Now, there's different kinds of PLCs. The ones we're looking at here, those are the 315s from Siemens. They're, they're fairly kind of outdated right now, but we are going to do a lab where we work on the 315s. Uh, they're modular PLCs, so that means that we can keep adding uh, I.O. to it. Okay. A lot of the PLCs that we're going to program in class, we have the Siemens 1500. Uh, we do have the Siemens 314s, and we have some 1200s as well. And we have some Alan Bradley. So, uh, you know, just lots of different things. But ideally, what is a PLC, a programmable logic controller? It's kind of like a mini computer, like I said, but we're only going to use ladder logic and it only holds one program. That's it, nothing else, okay? And it's specific to the tasks at hand. So, initially, right, we wanted to replace relay logic because relay logic is very, very messy. Uh, we've talked about relays in electrical class and how much wiring it takes. Uh, just to get, you know, using relays and magnetic fields and sending signals and opening and closing uh, using relays uh, versus actually just programming the PLC to open and close contactors and things like that. Okay. Same principles kind of as computer architecture. All right. Uh, it just goes through, you know, the simple task of the program uh, that it's running as it goes through. So I keep talking about relay control and we've talked about relays in class, but if you look on the left, that's a relay control panel, all right? Lots of wiring entailed in a relay control panel. Lots of different things can go wrong. Uh, you know, troubleshooting if something goes out or the relay goes bad. Now these are nice because they're clear ones. You can physically go up to the relay and look and see, you know, is, is the clapper out or things like that on it. Or we can update it so that it's a PLC control panel. And they're all wired to a PLC in different IOs that literally just open and close as we automatically tell them to. A lot cleaner of a control panel, all right? And we can do a lot more with PLCs than we can relays. It's much more cost effective to use a PLC. Even though some PLCs are very expensive, our, our Siemens 1500 are very expensive PLCs, uh, you know, versus like a Siemens logo or a Siemens 1200, they aren't quite as expensive, all right? But, you know, they don't, their functionality isn't as good. They don't have as many IOs. Uh, that we can control and do that sort of thing. But as you can see though, relay control, all right, takes a lot of wiring, lots of wiring to just do some basic controls. And we're, you know, we're talking about all the controls that we've worked in, you know, all the classes and things like that. But, you know, essentially PLCs were there to, pro, to, to get rid of relay logic and do everything through PLC. Now, that doesn't mean relay control panels don't exist anymore. If there's only a few I.O., sometimes it makes more sense to do relay control panels versus PLCs. Because PLCs can get pricey and expensive. So if, we, if we're not controlling a ton of different things, it might make more sense to actually, you know, use relay controls instead of buying an expensive PLC for something, you know, very similar or very small as well. Okay? So what's good about PLCs, though, is their increased reliability. They do not crash and reset like Windows, uh, you know, things like that that goes wrong. They're very, very reliable, okay? 
All the logic is contained in the PLC, uh, PLC's memory, so there's no chance of actually making any wiring errors either. All right. Once a PLC is running and operable or an operating, it's not going to go wrong. So when something breaks, it's not because of the PLC. You can't just you know randomly change the program, or it's not going to get a virus, or, or those sort of things. It's not the PLC. There might be a wiring issue in the field with something. All right, we can use the PLC to actually determine, you know, what's not working. So it actually helps us troubleshoot a system as well. Uh, much more advantageous there. All right, it's much more flexible. So what does that mean? It's easier for us to change a program in like 30 seconds and re-upload it than go out and actually have to relay an entire uh, or rewire a relay panel when we go out there so you know with PLC's I can work remotely from home and tie into the PLC change a code and everything will work we don't have to go out and physically rewire everything because everything is addressed to the inputs and to the outputs on the PLC that's the beauty of it we don't have to go rewire anything we just change how the control works on, on everything. So everything's kind of wired once, where if we had to do a relay panel, we would actually physically have to go out and rewire everything up. So much more flexible, much more easier, uh, you know, to work with and much more easier for troubleshooting, okay? And lower cost in the long run. It's very expensive to actually have to wire up a bunch of PLCs, right? Uh, very cost and effective because you have to pay someone to wire all these up. All right, more trouble with maintenance. Look at how many different wires we've got going into different relays there. Okay, so it kind of goes back to what I said before though. If it's a smaller application, okay, maybe half a dozen controls, then we're gonna do relay logic. It's not effective to buy a PLC, but anything greater than that, much more effective to buy a PLC, all right, and do it that way. And then you don't ever have to rewire anything. It's all about just changing your, your program. Okay, so the beauty of them is PLCs can communicate with other PLCs. So, uh, you know, for us on our 870 trainer, each station has its own PLC, right? We've got seven stations back there. Each one has its own PLC, but they also have a handshake, so they can communicate with each other, all right? Uh, we can have a master PLC that can run a process that controls all the individual processes as well. We can gather data, we can monitor devices, we can interact with HMIs, human machine interfaces, and, and do a lot of different things. So it really helps us, you know, if something's going wrong, I can plug into the PLC and be like, hey, you know, the ladder logic's working until this specific, you know, IO or this specific input. All right, so is it this limit switch or things like that? It's much more easier for us to monitor it than to actually have to go out, you know, like we've done in the electrical class, put a meter on it and take readings and figure out, hey, uh, what's, what's wrong here? Which sensor's bad? Where's it out, you know, in the program type thing? So it really helps us, okay? Plus we get much faster response times, okay? Because the PLC is a computer, all right? It is going to be able to cycle through. A PLC goes through its entire program every time and is constantly checking inputs and outputs, all right? And the faster, you know, PLC processor that we can get in there, the faster it's gonna be able to pick up, you know, response times for sensors and things like that. So very much, much much more rapid response um, with PLCs uh, as far as production and, and being able to check things and get the inputs and outputs in uh, really quick and like I've talked about multiple times it's much easier for us to troubleshoot and fix problems we can see what's going on when we can actually monitor the program live as it's working and you guys are gonna see that when you start programming the PLCs and you guys get a program station one as your final anyways you can see you know where it's stopping and what's making it stop so that's really good it's very nice that you can tap into the PLC and see where the programs having issues that's gonna tell you oh this sensors bad now the PLC doesn't say you know hey this sensors out to you but it tells you that something's happening that that sensors either not getting the signal or that sensors not producing the signal which can help you you know fixate in on that specific sensor that might have gone out or what's going on with the motor or different things like that. So it's very, very key for us uh, in troubleshooting. All right, so let's break it down to the different parts of a PLC, okay? 
And this is common amongst all PLCs. It doesn't matter if we're talking about our old Siemens 314s or our new Siemens 1500s or, you know, an Allen Bradley versus our Mitsubishi. The, the basic construct of a PLC is always the same, okay? So every PLC has its CPU, its Central Processing Unit, okay? Every PLC, we have to interface with a computer. We're gonna write the program on our laptops, okay? We're using uh, Siemens TIA portal, all right? We're gonna write up the ladder logic and we're gonna interface with the CPU and download it, okay? You have to remember that all these PLCs run on 24 volt DC. So they have to have a power supply. All the PLCs we're gonna use is 24 volt controls. So, right, we still plug into the wall, that's 120 volt AC. So our power supply transforms it, all right, and down to 24 volt DC. It also you know, um, rectif um, rectifies it as well, okay? So we have to uh, use 24 volts for everything. All of our control voltages, 24 volts. So. For us, right, like we learned in electrical class, 24 volts signifies a one, and zero volts signifies a zero, because we're doing everything in binary. Something is either on or off, okay? Every PLC has inputs and outputs, all right? So those connect to the, uh, the modules that are connected to the PLC, and we have different PLCs that are modular or fixed, all right? So that just depends on the amount of inputs and outputs that we can put on. Okay, but all PLCs have an input module, an output module, a CPU, a power supply, and a way to interface. So our older interface with our PLCs, we use an MPI versus our newer ones, we're just using an Ethernet Cat5 cable. All right, and all of our new PLCs have an, um, an IP address, and we're able to interface with that, okay? So that's the basic construct of every PLC, if we look at it, okay? So when we start talking about PLC hardware, we have open architecture or closed architecture. Okay, so when we have open architecture, that's non-proprietary. Okay, so that allows the system to easily be connected. When I mean proprietary, I'm saying things like Allen Bradley, I'm saying things like Siemens. So open architecture means you're talking about software um, or PLCs that work with any kind of software. All right, I can program, you know, all these different PLCs, maybe using my Siemens uh, TIA portal, okay? That'd be great. But most stuff is closed architecture. So I want you to start thinking about, all right, we talk about Windows operating system. Every single thing works with Windows, all right? It's still proprietary, but most things work with Windows. Whereas you buy an Apple product, right? Apple only works with Apple. So in the big scheme of things, okay, that's how most of our PLCs, they're closed architecture, which means Siemens equipment only works with Siemens equipment very well. Allen Bradley equipment only works with Allen Bradley equipment very well. Can you get those two to talk and see each other? Yes, it's possible, but it's a lot more confusing and it doesn't always work out the way that you want it to. So, when it's proprietary, right, we're paying for something. Either we're, you know, like Alan Bradley, we're paying for the PLCs and we're getting the software for free, or Siemens, we gotta pay for both, uh, you know, different things like that, uh, you know. And it's it's their software that works with their PLCs. So I can't go take like my, my Siemens software, per se, and go program my Alan Bradley PLC. Sometimes there's different companies that have uh, the ability to share that but most don't. So that's really kind of the difference between open architecture and closed architecture. You know, Siemens works with Siemens stuff. Alan Bradley works with Alan Bradley stuff uh, and, and things. It's just, you know, it's their, it's their own stuff and it's designed to work with that, all right? So we use Profibus versus Profinet or, or things like their device net, all right? Just different ways that they communicate with each other. So I can't use an Alan Bradley cable on a Siemens PLC either. So generally when you buy a system, all right, or whatever machine, you buy all Siemens or you buy all Allen Bradley, you know, so everything interfaces correctly. So when you go to a plant, all right, there are different, you know, machines that, you know, some plants might have Allen Bradley and Siemens, some might be all Siemens, some might be all Allen Bradley, or some might be all Mitsubishi. All right, but generally those systems don't talk to each other. You might have a plant that has multiple systems in it, 
All right, but they don't necessarily talk to each other because they're on a machine that's like doing a specific task. They don't need to talk to each other. So you can still be able to have that. Okay, so I've been talking about fixed and modular I.O. So fixed I.O., okay, that's typical of our small PLC. So, uh, you know, what's in the picture here, those are the Siemens 314s. All right, those are kind of our older PLCs. We have our 1500s, but they're fixed PLCs. They have a specific number of I.O., inputs and outputs, right, that it can communicate with and that we can wire up to. So fixed I.O. systems. So when you buy like a 1200, okay, or a Siemens logo, there's a really small amount of inputs and outputs that are on those. Okay, and they're designed that way. They're not designed to handle large tasks. There's different PLCs to do different tasks and how much they can handle, all right? But fixed I.O., it's kind of like, you know, when we look at our little Arduino boards, there's only a certain number of I.O. that we can use on our Arduino boards. Same kind of concept. Where we have modular I.O., we have more components that we can add. So inside like our FANUC robot cabinets, all right, we have modular I.O. that's in there. So we can keep adding different inputs and outputs that interface with our robot. So that's really cool as well. But if we look back at the troubleshooting unit that we have, or the troubleshooting uh, trainer that we have in the back of the classroom, that's used, those are using the 315 PLCs. Those are modular. You can see that there's a bunch of different modules on there. So there's multiple I.O. addresses that we can interface with and program. We can just do a lot more, all right? It's kind of like the master PLC that can control all the separate PLCs uh, as well. So that's really the difference between fixed I.O. and modular I.O. Modular I.O., we can, the PLC can handle it and we can keep expanding and adding more inputs and outputs. Fixed I.O., we can only handle, you know, say 128 inputs and outputs or something like that, okay? Power supply. All right, we've talked about this briefly, right? That's the parts of the PLC, but that's where we gotta, we have to take our 120 volts that it plugs into, okay? or whatever or single phase that we feed it to, okay? It rectifies it and then converts it to 24 volt DC because all of our uh, IO runs on 24 volt DC. Same with the brains of our, um, of our PLC itself, okay? So generally this is kind of what the power supplies look like. You'll see and I'll point them out to you on the different PLCs. Sometimes they're attached, sometimes they're separate. All right, on some of ours, our power supplies uh, separate. And I'll show you that in, uh, you know, some of you guys in the motor control class, you're going to be wiring up to the power supply anyways uh, to do the different control systems, okay? So the processor is not something you can see, but it sits inside. It looks just like a mini motherboard, so if we were to open up a computer and take a look at a motherboard, you know, that's really what's going on. But it's, it's specific to this task and it can only handle so much. Now the programs we store on the memory card, so I'll show you where those are uh, as well. But... Um, what happens is, is when you download your program onto the CPU, you overwrite whatever was on there. So it automatically wipes, puts the new program on each time. And that program stays on there until you wipe it again. So even if you have to make a change, you don't really go into the program on the PLC and make a change. You make the change in the software on the laptop you're on, and then you re-upload the program. Okay, so that's really kind of how it happens when you're fixing it. So this is on a test as well. Here's what a PLC is constantly doing. Once you turn it on, this is all it does. It sits here and scans and goes through this cycle. It reads all the inputs so it knows where everything is and what needs to happen. Then it goes through the ladder logic. It executes the program, okay? It communicates and then it updates all the outputs based on the inputs as it executes through the program and goes through each rung in the ladder logic. And then it starts all over and reads the inputs. It is just constantly sitting there scanning. So even though if you look at our 870 trainer and it's not operating, but everything's turned on, all the PLCs are just sitting there constantly scanning, waiting for something to happen, just repeatedly doing this process, okay? That's really all they're doing. All right, so I keep, you know, saying I.O., inputs and outputs, and how we can wire everything. So, you know, we call these field devices. Inputs and outputs are called field devices because they're not at the PLC. They're out in the field. So, you know, your PLC, your control cabinet, doesn't necessarily sit at the piece of equipment, all right? There might be a designated control uh, center 
module that has you know a bunch of different PLCs or just like we have a motor control center where all the controls for the motor you know sit in a bunch of different little cabinets in a motor control center building they're not all literally right at each machine now some of these are okay so that's why we call them field devices so your limit switches any of your sensors your push buttons all of those things that are out in the field all right you might have a pressure sensor you might have a temperature sensor all those different things those are all inputs okay those sit out in the field and they are wired back to the cabinet that's housing the PLC okay so that's really what's going on there so we wire all those back and I'll look at and show you on the on the trainer okay we have different output devices so our motor starters or our solenoids those are output devices so based on the input devices all right we do an output device so you know one of the common ones we talk about in here and what you guys program right <clears throat> so say we have a mixer then that that mixer can't turn on until the pressure switch and the temperature switch are at a certain level and then when those are at a certain level they turn on the motor okay that mixes whatever we're mixing all right so the in this case right the pressure switch and the temperature switch those are inputs the plc is constantly scanning waiting for those inputs when those inputs say all right they're on we're at the right temperature and the right pressure and then in the program it says oh all right turn on this motor which is an output device or turn on this solenoid which controls this pneumatic device okay so different things like that so that's how our inputs and our outputs interface and how these plc works and you guys we've we've programmed some adreno boards and we've done different things like that we're in motor controls uh, we, we've done a lot of this stuff just in different labs so this is kind of just putting it all together for you guys when we go this all right so programming device we don't have any handheld programming devices for any of our trainers in that but we do do this in the robotics class right we have our teach pendant that's a handheld programming device because when you're writing that teach pendant it's actually kind of doing the program for you now we're not using ladder logic inside our fanic cabinets all right it's still a c plus plus type based program but you're still using a handheld programming device and you're still controlling everything inside the cabinet okay so for us we're going to use ladder logic we're going to be using our siemens tia portal totally integrated automation that's what tia stands for uh, portal so we're going to be using our ladder logic and we're going to be writing everything in ladder and then uploading it to our plc's okay so everything you're going to see in my lecture though because it's tied to our textbook our textbook is all alan bradley so there's going to be some differences uh, in some of my lectures when i show you what we're doing with our siemens stuff versus showing you what we're doing um, you know in the book using the alan bradley okay so this is using our alan bradley um, logics five software and things like that that you're going to see so this is monitoring so we can monitor live so when we hook up our laptops and you guys you know program the plc and you upload it and we can go live and actually monitor what the PLC is doing as it's live. So it's very good troubleshooting for us to do. Uh, you know, when they show up flashing for us in our Siemens, it's a, it's a nice green or red, you know, sort of, you know, color so we can see, you know, what's live, what's on, what's off, and those sort of things. So, uh, you know, we're able to monitor. So that's very good. I can monitor from home. So as long as I know the IP address of our Siemens 1500, I can log in, I know the IP address, and over the internet, I can sit there and monitor, you know, what's going on at school on our programs, okay? So let's just start understanding a little bit. We're not going to get into the heart of programming in this lecture, but we need to understand, you know, what's going on, what the program is doing. So when we start talking about ladder logic, it looks like a ladder, okay? We have a set of instructions that are on each rung. And it goes each rung from left to right, top to bottom. So you can see where it says instructions here. All right, we have normally open, normally closed contactors, and we have an output coil. All right, so when whatever we're looking for holds true, it would turn something on or turn something off. So our instructions go on a rung, and you can see each rung. And this is why it's ladder logic. It literally looks like a ladder. Okay, we have our two rails, and then we have our different rungs. Okay, and then when we OR something, we use what we call a branch statement. So a branch is technically us ORing. So 
it relates back to, and we're going to get into this again. Those of you guys that took digital electronics with me, this is where ANDs, ORs, and inverters all come back into play. Same with NAND, NOR, exclusive ORs. All of those translate, right? We use them as logic gates and did a lot of breadboarding and things like that. But all of that translates into ladder logic as well. So if I look at the top rung, those two are ANDed together. We have a normally open and a normally closed contactor. The normally closed contactor is the one with the line through it. So those are anded together. So for something to happen there, this and this has to happen. Okay. The one showing the branch, those are two normally open contactors. They're ORed together. This or this can turn this on. Okay. So I just want you to start thinking about things in that. And we're going to get, you know, more heavy into that as we get into this course. All right. So principles of operation. So. You know, I've already kind of talked about this problem, but we're going to go through it again. So, you know, processing controls here. So we have a mixer motor. It's used to automatically stir a vat when the temperature and the pressure reach preset values. That key word in there is temperature and pressure. That tells me those are anded together. So I'm not going to have a branch circuit there. I'm going to have just an inline and there. Okay, and then it says manual operation of the motor is provided by means of a separate push button start. So, they can turn on automatically when we are, have a specific temperature and a specific pressure, or I can manually turn this on. So I want you to think about those words. I can do this and this, or I'm going to do this. And let's see how that relates to our ladder logic right here. Now, what's shown on here is not necessarily ladder logic. It's just showing you more like, uh, think of like a schematic versus a wiring diagram. Okay, same kind of concept here. But notice what? We have our rungs, our line one, our line two, those are the power coming into the PLC, okay? Now, we said our pressure switch and our temperature switch. When those are correct, the motor starts, or I can push the manual push button and they will start. So I want you to really understand this, this paragraph and how it relates to the ladder logic. Pressure switch and temperature switch Okay, and we're not going to show them like that in ladder logic. We're going to have normally open contactors, or we have our manual push button. Okay, so that's how the program will be set up for you, and you need to start thinking like this. This and this happen, or this happens to get this to start. Okay, so you got to think about that. All right, so we have to look at what? These are all of our inputs on our PLC. All right, so for Siemens, we're going to use... Uh, we got inputs and outputs, so our inputs are going to be I, our outputs are going to be Q's as we start addressing these. So each one of these, you know, uh, inputs is going to have an address. So the pressure switch is going to have an address. The temperature switch will have an address. The push button will have an address. And those are all wired to specific locations on the PLC that are tied to the specific address in question. Okay, so. The addresses in my lecture aren't going to, in the Alan Bradley lectures, aren't going to match the addresses that we use in our Siemens programming. But the ideology, the, mytholo the methodology is the same uh, behind everything, okay? So the output devices will also have addresses as well. That motor control starter, okay, will have a specific address, and it's on the output side of the module. So we look at our inputs. And it goes through the program, right? It scans the inputs and controls the outputs and continually does that same cycle. Okay, so when we enter this in now, what we're looking at, if you cover up what's kind of in blue and red on the outside of this diagram, what's inside, okay, with the I slash 1, I slash 2, O slash 1, I slash 3, those, that's the ladder logic. So what we've just talked about, you know, the pressure switch and the temperature switch or the manual push button turn on the motor starter coil. That's our ladder logic right there. Now those are Allen Bradley tags, I slash one. Okay, so if we were gonna do Siemens, it might be I 0, 0.0 or I 0, 0.1 or I 0, 0.3. Okay, our outputs for Siemens, they have it as O slash one. That's Allen Bradley. For us, Siemens wise that we're gonna program, you're gonna have like Q like 4.0 or Q 4.1. Okay, so we're, we're gonna get into the addressing and making sure that we know the correct addresses uh, when we do this, okay? But that's the guts of the ladder program for this specific problem here, okay? 
So for the program to operate, okay, we have to make sure that the PLC is actually in the run mode. Okay, there's a stop and a run and then it'll tell you if there's a fault or something and why it's not working as well. You need to be in the run mode and then it's either going to be run automatically based on the pressure switch or temperature switch or you're going to be able to go over and press the manual push button and the motor will turn on. Okay, this will make a lot more sense when we start programming all the different I.O. that we have in class. Okay, you're going to get in here, uh, you're going to program a stoplight and all kinds of different stuff in here. So. We will, we will get into the guts of programming here very shortly. I want you guys to kind of understand, you know, the basics behind this. Okay, so this is using Logic Pro. Okay, this is Alan Bradley. We do have a couple of labs that you're going to be doing using Logic Pro. So the ladder logic is the same. The addressing is really what's going to be different. All right, and it'll be different when we use some counters and timers uh, as well. But this is what it's going to look like on one of our labs, but the majority of the stuff we're gonna do is Siemens, so it'll be slightly different than there, okay? So everything you're gonna see in here that's Alan Bradley is Logic Pro. And uh, so what's on the right, that's the ladder, the ladder logic, all right, so that you are able to see it execute, okay? So we can look at the different ways that you would wire up. So this is just a small PLC, all right, Alan Bradley PLC, so you can look at the PLC and kind of see, you know, the number of inputs and outputs that are on it. These are both fixed, right? They don't look like they have any modules that connect to it or anything like that. So there's a fixed number of inputs and outputs on each one of these PLCs, okay? So if we want to modify the operation, all right, remember I told you if it was relay logic, we would actually have to physically go out there and rewire a bunch of stuff up. It might take us an hour or something to get in there, uh, you know, double check our wiring, make sure everything's operational. PLC, all we got to go is change our branch. So what changed in this program? Well, the original program was what? Pressure switch and temperature switch or manual push button. So in this program, what's changed? We've said, all right, it can be the pressure switch or the manual push button, but we have to be at the specific temperature. So no matter what, it's pressure switch or manual push button and the temperature has to be at the specified temperature. So we've modified the program here that no matter what, this will not be allowed to turn on either by pressure or manually until the temperature has reached the specified temperature for this program. So that's really you know one of the key advantages with PLCs. We don't have to go rewire this. We just change the ladder logic, re-upload it, and it's operating the way that we want it to. Okay. Like I said, if a relay system, it would cost a lot of rewiring, okay, and unnecessary work. It might take us a lot, you know, an hour or two to go do what we can do on a PLC in like 30 seconds, okay? So that's the, the benefit of using a PLC to do this, okay? If we simulate it, okay, I'm not going to get in through, you know, PLCs versus computers, uh, you know, the architecture might be the same, you know, it's got a motherboard and those sort of things, the, but... We don't use P, uh, you know, PCs or computers in industry, okay? We use PLCs to operate in an industrial environment, okay? They can withstand things like temperatures better, or we might be in a textile mill. There's not a lot of fans. There's not a lot of dust that's involved. They run cooler than a computer, okay? So they can handle a bunch of different environments and temperatures and humidity and things like that. So that's why we use something like a PLC, all right? And we don't have like a big old operating system like Windows that's gonna go down. PLCs are much more reliable than computers and things like that, okay? So this is a nice clean cabinet with a PLC. This one's modular, right? I can look at this and tell you it's modular. There's a bunch of different IOs. In fact, I think we actually have this PLC in one of the cabinets in the back. Um, very clean, clean wiring system, all right, and you can see all the wires have a nice tag on them, okay, and it's very important that we put the PLCs and the control wiring separate from the main power wiring, all right, it's in the National Electric Code, but remember in electrical class, all right, if you put your thumb in the direction of the current, okay, and you curl your fingers, you know, current gives off a magnetic field, so if we're with, you know, three, 480 volt, three phase, current, there's a large magnetic field going on in those cable trays. Well, that magnetic field can impact the PLCs and controls. So everything for controls goes in a separate cable tray. So power cables go in one tray, 
okay? And then control cables go on a separate one, nowhere near each other so that we don't get the magnetic field uh, interference or electrical noise as we call it, but it's really a magnetic field that disrupts that from current flowing through electronics. So your control circuits, you know, your 24 volt stuff, they don't give off large enough magnetic fields to interrupt with each other, but your motors do, all right? Your 480 volt electricity, and you know, you're running even higher than 480 volt or three phase and things like that uh, in an industrial system as well. So you don't want that kind of interference going on, okay? So, and the difference is we don't program computers in ladder logic, only PLCs. It's a, it's a, it's a language that's specific to PLCs. But it is common amongst every type of PLC. Everybody uses ladder logic for PLCs. So, once you know how to do a Siemens, you understand for the most part how to do an Allen Bradley. You just need to learn the subtle differences between, you know, timers, counters, addressing, and a few things like that. But for the most part, your ladder logic thinking is still the same. We're still anding things, oring things, exclusively oring things, and anding, noring. We're still doing basic logic control. Okay? And, you know, computer is much more complex. And then there's always, you know, the Windows issue or Windows is updating or, you know, all those other different things that slow you down. There is nothing to slow down a PLC, okay? It does every single program in an orderly fashion. We already went through that scan where we're scanning the inputs, executing the program, updating the outputs, and going over and over and over, okay? It always does that. It always reads it from left to right, top to bottom when it executes the program as well. Okay, no issues like you have with computers. All right, troubleshooting. Your PLC is going to tell you if, you've, if you're running and everything's good. It's going to tell you if there's a fault. Okay, it might go through a few steps in the program and, and it's going to fault. And we're going to be able to monitor the program and check out, you know, which input or output is, is causing the fault or what's going on. Why can't we start up the PLC? It might not meet our initial conditions that we put in the program, uh, you know, for it to happen. Okay, so... We just have our software, right? So that's how we're programming it. Everything, everybody's going to sit on a laptop or a desktop, and we're going to sit down, and we're going to program everything in, in TIA portal, and then we're going to upload to the PLC. So there is no software that's really on the PLC that you're interfacing with. So you have to upload it every single time that you make a change, okay? So that allows us to monitor what's going on like we've talked about. It also allows us to monitor an HMI. Now in our courses, we're not gonna get into HMI in your level two courses. You are gonna get into some HMI and, and learning how to program that and, and read it and use it and do all those different things. But we're not going to do uh, any HMI stuff in our coursework, okay? That's the next level. But what are we doing? HMI allows us to monitor a system that's running. Okay, so uh, you know, not, you know we, we usually take a field trip to Bridgestone every year or two so when we go look at their little atoms they have a big screen all right that's monitoring what all their little atoms are doing and things like that all right we have an hmi on our 870 trainer but it doesn't monitor much and it's not really set up uh, for how we kind of like it but in hmi you know you can also go up and push a button to monitor a specific system all right uh, you know in these hmis they're kind of used you know, in fast food restaurants around the world now so like I went to Italy not too long ago and you could go into the McDonald's there and just walk up and punch in your order there. So I didn't have to worry about a language barrier or anything like that. I just can hit English on the screen. I can go down, place my order. Even though it's a touch screen and you're ordering, it's still an HMI, a human machine interface. We're interfacing with the computer and choosing what we want. So same kind of concept there. All right, PLC size and application. I'm gonna go through this one kind of fast, right? It really just depends on what you're running and how many inputs and outputs that you need. All right, so you know everything's going to talk about you know small ones that are anywhere from 15 to 128 I/O, medium ones 128 to 512 I/O. Anything that's large is over 512 inputs and outputs. That's a, that's a pretty large PLC. It's doing a lot of different things. That might be your master PLC that's overseeing all the other ones. Okay, so the three major types of PLC. Single-ended, multitask, and control management. So like the last one I was just talking about, probably control management. So a single-ended application involves one PLC controlling one process. So that's where we are. If we look at the 870 trainer back there, 
each station has a single PLC and it's controlling that specific process, whether it's the pick and place, the gauging, the indexing, the sorting, the queuing, you know, putting the, the robotic piece in with the interface and placing, um, you know, the, the spring and the valve and into the spool and doing those sort of things. Single ended application, a PLC controlling one process. Okay, a multitask PLC, right? It involves several processes going on at a time and it interfaces with each other. Okay, you got to make sure that you have enough inputs and outputs. So a PLC overseeing multitask. So if we had like a multitask PLC, it would be running our whole 870 trainer and we wouldn't have an individual PLC on each one. That would be like a multitask type one. And if we have control management, there's a PLC that's running like the entire plant. So this one's running the line. This one's running, you know, welding. This one's running putting. I'm just talking about, you know, if we're talking about, um, you know, maybe a manufacturing cars or something like this. This one's running welding. This one's running, you know, painting and that sort of thing. But then, then there's an overview control management PLC that's keeping track of matching up the car doors with the original car and in knowing, you know, how the paint changes based on the body style and things like that. So all those kind of different things that might run the plant, you know, as a whole. All right, and then just different memory pieces that are in a PLC. Uh, you know, these slides are a little outdated. Our book's a little outdated because, you know, memory is constantly doubling and changing, right? We go from, you know, 32 to 64 to 128 to 512 to 1024 to 2048. You know, and we're doubling, all right? We're, in, we're getting into terabytes and things like that. So, you know, how much memory the PLC, you know, can store and how big of a program you can get in that sort of thing. So it really, you know, how much memory do we need? It really depends on the number of inputs and outputs. So your, you know, your smaller PLCs don't need as much memory as your larger PLCs do. Okay. All right, guys. Well, that's it for this one. Um, that's the end of uh, chapter one. And uh, let me know if you have any questions. But like I said, I want to go through the first, you know, five or six chapters fairly quickly so that we can get to programming. I really think for you to understand PLCs. Uh, us stepping in, programming, and actually seeing stuff work is amazing in this class. Uh, versus, this is just to give you a little bit of background knowledge and understand, you know, the different parts of a PLC and what a PLC is doing. Okay, we are going to get into understanding the logic behind it, and we are going to start programming fairly soon. But else, as normal, email me if you have any questions or if we need to do a team meet or a Zoom meet or something along those lines. Else, guys, have a great day. I will see you in class.